So hello everyone, thank you all for coming. Good to have you all here. Uh, welcome to Ichimoku Trading. Uh, set up so to watch for in any time frame using the Ichimoku Club. This class is being recorded, and so um, you know just to let you all know, if we can, I'd like it that we keep all our questions focused, uh, guided, directed towards the Ichimoku Cloud. I know some of this information will be new to some of you, and some of it will be not so new. Um, but it would be great if we can keep all our questions directed and guided towards Ichimoku because that's what the class is about. Now, because it is sort of still a new subject, there may be some people in here that either this is your first time or that um, you have some experience with uh, Ichimoku, but this is your first time in this class. If you have experience with Ichimoku, but this is your first time in this class, let me know. And if you have no experience with Ichimoku, then this is obviously your first class then please let me know as well. So, Curtis has an exclamation point. Does that mean yes or no, or just an exclamation point? <laughs> just trying to understand what that means. I'm pretty good at reading symbols. Yes, first time in Ichi class. Good, fantastic. Welcome, Curtis. Good to have you here. Anyone else? Two within that category? Justin says, I have no experience with Ichimoku. Fantastic. All right, great. And anyone else in that category? I know we got a lot of people that have been coming here. This class has actually been going on for three years now. Um, and so we do have a lot of regulars in here. For those of you that keep coming back, stay with it. Because the bottom line is, like anything, you know, if you really continue to practice it, you really continue to work at it and come back again and again and again, you really put your effort in, generally you will get better. You know, it's uh, there were definitely moments in time in my trading in the very beginning, you know, in my first year. I had a lot of good success in the first year, but I also had some failures as well. And I can't imagine what trading would be like if I had just stopped coming to, you know, if I'd stopped studying and stopped trying and stopped reading the charts again and again and again. It wouldn't be what it is today. And so, you know, for those of you who have been coming back again and again and again, um, kudos to you. Keep coming back. Trading does get easier and trading can be profitable. It's something that you can do full time. Uh, it's something that I do. It's something that other people do. It's a reality. And it's not that I'm smarter than the next person. Um, you know, there are a lot of people in here that are probably smarter than me. Intelligence doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be successful, but effort generally has a direct correlation to your success. And so keep coming back again and again and again and you will see differences. This can be learned. So let's go and talk about real briefly what Ichimoku is about. I want to briefly describe some of the components for those of you who are new because we have a lot in here. We have Justin, we have Aldrin, uh, we have Ko, we have Pip Shaker, and we have Suresh. So we have a good amount of group of people here that are this is your first time and welcome to you. And so I'm going to spend some time just briefly describing it and what it's about, go over some of the components, and then we're going to get into some real life scenarios and talk about you know what the Ichimoku Cloud is communicating right now with a lot of the instruments that are out there, a lot of the ones that you're probably trading. So real briefly, the Ichimoku was created, it was first published late 60s, originally started in 1930s. The goal of it was to capture the majority of trends, capture trending moves. The guy who created it, Kuhichi Osada, believed that trending moves is where the most amount of profit is and can be made. And so he comes from a culture in Japan which is tend to be very patient, more concerned with efficiency, so they would rather trade less and get more profit per trade and have higher accuracy than trade more in lieu of having more trades, less accuracy to try and reach the same goal. To them, they're much more about efficiency and making the most out of each trade. And the Ichimoku was designed to generally capture 80% of the trade. And the thing about it is, is that that's the majority of what you want to catch in a trending move. Because the bottom line is the harder parts to make money in a trending environment is the last 10% and the begin the first 10% of the move. It's the hardest part of a trending move to capture. Both 
because in the beginning it's hard to actually detect, hey, this really is a trend, and at the end that also takes a little bit of skill as well. It takes a lot of skill to really detect the very beginning of a trend and the end of a trend. And so Gohosada's figuring was, let's just capture the lion's share of it because that's where really all the money is. And if you look at this last move here, that's pretty much how it plays itself out. 80% of the move here and here, that's a good chunk of change right there. That's really, you know, that's a little bit easier to make money inside this area than it is to make money inside here or inside here. And so that was one of the main goals was to capture trending moves, ideally 80% of that particular trend or move. The other thing about it is, is that it, because it's very good at picking trends, it's also very good at detecting reversals. Now, in terms of detecting reversals, it's not necessarily trying to pick tops and bottoms per se. Um, I use other methods to pick pot tops and bottoms, and I can do that pretty easily. It's not too complicated. But it does do a good job picking up reversals through weeding out false signals and weeding out continuation signals so that when the pair really does reverse, it really is saying, hey, this thing's done. Now, we've got a couple questions right off the bat, and let's just briefly address them because it seems like they're in line. Alex says, how would you use Ichi to defend and to identify trend changes, IT tops and bottoms? I wouldn't use Ichimoku to defi define tops and bottoms, um, but I could use it to define trend changes. And there are many ways that you can do that. One of them is through Kumo breaks. And we'll explain the components as to why. Um, I'll need to explain some of the components of the Kumo, how it's constructed, so that once you understand it, then you can kind of understand why it's used for reversals. Other things you can use is the Kijun Sen, or the Kijun line, which is this red line here. And so, before we get further into explaining your question, I'd like to get into explaining some of the components. Then we can go over some of the methods for detecting trend changes. Manoj has a question here. He says, hi, Chris. I need to go in 10 minutes, but I will be watching the recording. Have you noticed that price can reverse or bounce when at the level of a flat Kumo surface to the left of the price section? Respond to the flat Kumo in the past. Ah, you mean like if there is a Kumo in the past here, could this cause price to bounce further in the future? Or maybe this Kumo, or whatever. Um, here's the thing about that. I would give that as a whole very, very little weight. It's not that it's not a clever idea. It's clever, I have to admit it. Just, just based on cleverness, it definitely deserves points. But I wouldn't be using previous flat sections of the Kumo to determine where the pair or instrument is likely to bounce or reverse or anything like that. I would not use that. Um, they don't use that in Ichimoku circles. Um, the Gohichu Sada did not use that. Uh, the last one, Hidenopa Sasaki, whose book right now I'm having translated. Finally found somebody. They're translating it. And from the information that I got, they're, they don't use the previous Kumos to gauge future support and resistance. They use the current Kumo up to the future Kumo to gauge future support and resistance. So as a whole, you know, it's something that you've noticed, and in some and here's here I'll give it a little bit of weight. And what do I mean by by that? About eight percent of weight. Why would I give it eight percent of weight? Because the bottom line is is that the Kumo structure is based upon previous price action, and so that previous price action can have an influence on future support and resistance. But I wouldn't use that as a strategy. I wouldn't use it as a major method. In fact, the correlation I'd probably say is relatively low. But it can happen from time to time, which is probably why you're noticing it. So, but as a whole, I generally don't give it too much weight. But it's a very good question. So, and I'm sorry you have to go in 10 minutes, and we'll see you next time, and hope you enjoy the recording. Now, before I really get into some of these further questions here that will be piping down the line, I need to explain to those of you that are new the construction 
of the Ichimoku Clause. So once you understand that, then you'll really understand all of what we're talking about to some degree, or at least you'll have the, the seeds to understand, or the soil to understand what we're talking about. So there are generally four components of the Ichimoku Cloud that I recognize. The fifth one I do not, it's not that I don't recognize, I just don't use it. But the four components are this. The first one here is this white line. It's called the Tenkinsen. It's like a price action line of sorts. It takes the last nine periods, takes the, the high and the low last nine periods, and what it does is it averages that and then it puts it into a price action line. This Tenkinsen is designed to gauge the underlying momentum of an instrument. And so it gauges the momentum of an instrument, and that can be very useful for telling you where it is, what's you know the instrument's likely to do, how it's going to respond, and so forth. We'll get a little further into how it actually has an effect upon trading and also the Ichimoku Club. The next line that you see here is called the Kijunsen. This will translate into trend line. And this is designed as pretty much it says, it's designed to gauge the overall trend of the instrument. It's designed to tell you where the trend is, if it's contained or not contained. If it's flat, if it's climbing, if it's falling, that's what it's designed to do as a general gauge. Now, now that you understand those two, the we can start to get into the Kumo itself, which is to me the most unique part of the Ichimoku cloud. This Kumo is the cloud, but it has two components here. The first part is this white line here. This white line is really, you take the red line and you take the white line, you divide it in half, shoot 26 time periods ahead, and it creates that value over there. So that's the white line over here, which has crossed down. Now, it's kind of interesting that it does that because what it's doing is, what Osada did is, he took the underlying momentum, the thing that gauges the underlying momentum for the instrument, and then he takes the underlying gauge for the trend of that instrument, and then he says, okay, halfway in between the momentum and halfway in between the trend, we put those two values together, we shoot that into the future because that should represent some sort of gauge for future support and resistance. So it's kind of brilliant. He's really taking two underlying essences of price action and saying this should have a representation or some sort of ability to detect future support and resistance. But he didn't just isolate that by itself. He created something, that's called Senku Span A. He created something else called Senku Span B, which is this blue line here. And this blue line is based purely upon price action. It takes the highest high plus the lowest low over the last 52 time periods. Now we're on a daily chart, so that would be the equivalent of 52 candles, aka two months of price action. Should be IE, not aka, but I use aka a lot. So IE, two months of price action. And then what it does is it divides that in half and then shoots that 26 time periods ahead. And that becomes known as Senko Span B. The shading in between is really just the shading between the two values. Now, this Kumo is kind of dynamic and unique. It changes over time. It has trajectory. It has a thickness or thinness to it. It can have it to where it's belly side up or belly side down. What that means is the Senko Span A is up or the Senko Span A is down. That can all have a gauge and a bearing on the Kumo. And the Kumo's main job is to identify or give you a gauge for support and resistance. Now that may be different from what you've been looking at support and resistance before because maybe you've been playing with, say, Fibonacci's. And you pull up a Fibonacci from this last move and you have three lines in the sand. And so there's something that says, well, support and resistance is just lines in the sand. Or you may have used something called pivot points. 
And you see these pivot points are horizontal lines. And they have the same approach to support and resistance. Support and resistance is based on lines in the sand. That is a Western concept. And so that is a Western view. And I, when I say Western, I'm including pretty much European, all of Europe and the Americas. That's the general view of support and resistance. Well, Sato looks at it a little bit differently. He kind of deconstructs it and approaches it from a different perspective. He feels that support and resistance is based upon A, previous price action, and B, is not a line in the sand. To him, support and resistance, if it's based upon previous price action, has to be evolving, has to change over time, and probably is several layers deep. It's probably not just 135, 140, 145, you know, 133, 30. Or, it's generally not like that. It generally looks at support and resistance as several layers thick. And this is a different approach to this, a different approach to support and resistance, a different approach to technical analysis. And so when you start to understand that approach, then you really get an idea of how the Kumor operates. So now that is the basics of the Ichimoku cloud as a whole. And so now that I've explained that, I want to get into a couple charts and talk about them as to what they're presenting in real time and how we can use the Ichimoku to get an idea with that. Now this indicator that I just added was the 20MA. I have that on every single chart I have because the bottom line is the 20 EMA has a heavy influence over price action. Institutional players are using it. They're placing orders off of it, buy orders, sell orders, rejections, reversals. They're placing a lot of orders based on that. And because the institutional market watches it, I'm going to be watching it. And if you learn how to use that in conjunction with the Ichimoku, it can become a very powerful combination. Okay. So now that's the basics of the construction. Before I get into analyzing some charts, is there anybody here that, you know, for those of you who are new, we have a decent amount of people. Is anybody here has any questions about that? While you are writing down those questions and asking, I'm just going to take a brief sip of my juice. I feel like a kid. My juice. And then we will move on to the next section here. I guess not. Okay, fantastic. Doesn't look like it. Let's go ahead and then begin. I want to start talking about it. I want to start using it in real time. And as I use it in real time, you can get an idea of how it functions. I'd like to start off with the daily time frame on the euro, and then I want to jump into the four-hour time frame. Ooh, we got a question from Scott R. He says, hello, Chris. In your experience, does the Ichimoku work better, or is it more effective on certain currency pairs over others? It's a very good question. Um, traditionally, it was thought that the Ichimoku would be best used if only used on the Japanese yen. Well, there's some truth in that, in the sense of the bottom line is who's going to know how to trade the yen better than anybody else but the Japanese? They have more information about their culture, they have more information about their style. They're investing in the yen more naturally than you and I would be. And so they just have they they have their experience on that. And one methodology that they the one methodology that they use more than anything else out there is the Ichimoku. Now I've said this before, but I like to say this again, which is that There were these brokers that did a study on trading performance. And in one of the factors that they did in terms of analyzing trading performance was trader performance on particular pairs. Which pairs are traders more uh, accurate or profitable on than others? And in this finding, which is very interesting, they had noticed that traders tended to do worse on yen pairs as a whole. In fact, 
they had noticed <coughs> that the bulk of the retail traders that were trading the Japanese yen, dollar yen, if they had just stopped trading it as a whole, particularly European and Western traders, their accounts on average would grow about 15%. And initially they didn't have an explanation for it, but to me the answer was simple. The Japanese are the ones trading the Japanese yen more than anything else. They are using the Ichimoku cloud more than anything else to trade the Japanese yen. The Ichimoku cloud has a different way to gauge support and resistance. And because it gauges it in a completely different way, their support and resistance levels, i.e., their levels that they're going to be buying and selling the instruments, particularly the dollar yen and other instruments, are going to be slightly different than they will if you were using pivot points or Fibonacci. And so because of that, it tends to move to a slightly different rhythm, especially if you're not using Ichimoku. Have you ever noticed when you traded dollar yen that it's kind of like pulling back, pulling back, pulling back, and all of a sudden it just rejects off a certain level and you're looking around and you can't find anything. You can't find a pivot point. You can't find a Fibonacci. You can't find anything that it should have rejected off of. Well, a lot of times when you throw up an Ichimoku cloud, you can then find out, hey, oh, it was rejecting off the Kijun or the Tenken or, you know, the Kumo or something like that. And those levels are often very different from traditional Western indicators. So the theory, which is kind of a natural postulate of this, which is understandable, is that the Ichimoku is more effective on certain currency pairs over others. It is highly effective in terms of trading the yen pairs, but it is also highly effective in trading euro dollar, sterling dollar, dollar Swiss. Um, the pairs that I would be less excited to trade it on would be some of more of the you know, less liquid crosses like Euro Aussie or Euro Canadian or, uh, you know, Aussie Kiwi and things like that. It's not that I wouldn't use them. It's just that I would feel less excited to use them on that. In fact, I'd just be less excited to trade them on a whole. It's not that there isn't good trading opportunities on those pairs. It's just that generally most systems, you know, if you look at the bulk of systems that are out there, most of them are not built for Euro Canadian. Or Aussie Kiwi. They're built for pairs that have great liquidity with them. Because the higher the liquidity, the better the technical purity they move. And so I use the Ichimoku on any of the majors and I use them on the end crosses. And I haven't found that they had a statistical edge in terms of like use it on dollar yen as opposed to euro dollar. In fact, I've had very few trades on the dollar yen. Actually, the, the only yen pair I've been trading lately is the dollar yen because there's been a couple of trades that came up. But other than that, I've been using it on sterling and euro and Aussie, and it's worked quite well. In fact, I ended up November, and November was a month that, one of those months where I just had a lot more trades on the Ichimoku models than more of my other models. And I clocked in just, I think I ended the month at 74% accuracy on my trades. And so, and my, my losing trade was not even a fifth of the size as my greatest win. So Ichimoku had functioned really, really well uh, in November and I was trading it mostly on pairs that weren't yen related. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, in terms of certain currency pairs over others. It's really generally, it works well on a block. And if it doesn't work well on it, then it probably is not going to work well on that, you know, that period. So it's not that it's, it's not that it's biased towards certain pairs, but it does have a certain effectiveness on yen pairs. So hopefully answers your question. It looks like it did. Yuluda has a question here. What if we wanted another confirmation from another indicator to confirm the support and resistance with Ichi? What would be the best to marry with the Ichimoku? This is a good question. I generally don't like to marry off other people. I usually like to let them make their own decisions. But in regards to that, I found that the 20MA is very effective, can be effectively combined with Ichimoku. I've found that Fibonacci's work very well and can be very effectively combined with Ichimoku as well. 
Um, if I was to use anything else with Ichimoku, it would be pivot levels. And so those would be the three that uh, I would use them with and that I, those are the three, not that I would use them with, that I do use them with. And those are the ones that I found them to be most effective on over the last six plus years of doing Ichimoku. So hopefully that gives you some idea of what I combine it with. Okay. You're combining with the 50MA and it's doing pretty good. Sure, the 50MA is gonna, is gonna, you know, be pretty effective. I found between the MAs that I've been using, I found the 20, you know, after a great deal of testing and looking through, I found that the 20 EMA tends to work a little bit better because it has a good combination of accuracy and number of signals. The 50 moving average, you're going to have a lot less meeting points with the 50 moving average in, say, a tank in Kijun or uh, Kumo or something like that. But if you're finding it to work pretty good, then I would say stay with it, see if it keeps performing like that. You know, hopefully it does. And, you know, you might want to consider just checking it out with the 20 as well, but not throwing too many, too many MAs on the chart. Try it separately and see if you get a little more information, a little less information. Um, something to definitely, uh, something to definitely, you know, experiment with. DB has a question. Chris, do you teach exact Ichimoku strategies with fixed stops and take profits and how successful are they ballpark? Um, I do teach them in my advanced Ichimoku course. In fact, there was one student who recently emailed me, uh, or he sent me a message on the forum, uh, and he said, you know, I was trading Ichimoku before, and I've been having some success with it, but, you know, the difference is now is in the course, he knows exactly where to get in and where to get out. And so, um, you know, which is the whole goal of the course, is to teach rule-based systems and to teach you how to find very specific entries and exits. So I do teach that, uh, the very specifics inside that course. Hopefully answers your question. Okay, great. So now I want to start talking about your dollar, then I want to get into sterling, they're offering some very interesting formations, possible setups. Um, I would like to get into Aussie dollar and dollar Swiss. Anybody that was on my newsletter last week, you would have gotten uh, two free alerts that I mentioned on the Aussie dollar and dollar Swiss, and both those trades played out exceptionally well. Uh, they played exactly as we had said they would. And so we'll go over them as well, and if we have time, we'll check on a few other pairs. So let's talk about the current environment with the Urius dollar, and we'll talk about a daily and four hour. We're we'll spend a little bit on the daily and then more on the four hour. We'll talk about what opportunities there are. Your dollar has had a nice, impressive run for quite a while to the upside, and then it failed just above 142 and went on a pretty aggressive sell-off. It sold off 1,284 pips, actually a lot more than that. It had shed more like 1,300 pips inside the month of November, which is quite a massive move. Um, there were some people that had wanted to get long as this thing was breaking through the Kuma, and I suggested against it, and hopefully they heeded that advice because the thing shed another 400-plus pips after breaking through the Kuma. But now the thing has done something interesting. And I wonder, I just want to check on one thing real quick, that the pair has bounced a little bit. It had lows in the 2900 region, and it has then bounced since then. And so it's bounced a little bit, and it's not that it's bounced at certain fib levels. Maybe of this move here, this could definitely be something that it respected. But the bottom line, it has bounced. And now it's made it after breaking below the Kumo and shedding about 400 plus pips, the pair has bounced three out of four days. Today may be a fifth day. And what did it do? Ran right into the 20 MA, went into the Kumo, and then went back out of the Kumo. It then today had a high which rejected off the 20 MA and then rejected back off that again. So what is the Ichimoku telling us at this point? 
right now the Ichimoku is saying, look, the overall structure is still bearish. Why? Because we're still below the Kumo, we're still below the 20 MA. The Tenkin, which was falling heavily, has just turned sideways. So there's no trend to the upside. In fact, it's flat in terms of momentum. The Kijin has also gone flat, saying, hey, there was this, the presence of a downtrend, now it's gone flat. So the overall bias from the Ichimoku cloud is flat with a slightly downward bias. If it were to get on the other side of the 20 EMA and back into the Kumo, then that bias would change to flat to slightly to the upside, at least till it runs into the Kijun here. So it's not exactly from a daily chart perspective, it's not exactly something where we want to be looking to take a position and hold this for several days, expecting it to play out, because the bias isn't exactly exciting to one side or the other. But if we zoom into a slightly smaller time frame on the four hour, we get a slightly different picture. And I want to analyze that. First off, the euro has been below the Kumo for at least 20 days. In fact, this goes back 30 days. So the each of them, or the price section has been below the Kumo on the four hour time frame since the 9th of November. So we're talking almost a month now, almost 30 days. It had one penetration into it, which resulted in a tank and Kijin cross to the downside. And that sold off from roughly 136.5 all the way down to sub 130. If you were trading technical keys and crosses, you could have captured a majority of that 600 plus pip move with pretty much very little ease. However, the pair has now begun something a little bit different. Not only has it pulled back into the Kumo, aka, or IE, support and resistance, and broken above the 20 MA and broken above the Kijun all in one swoop, it's also threatening another attack to break outside the Kumo, and it's also now using the 20 MA as support and not resistance. So there are a lot of structural changes that are in play right now on the EURUS dollar. Is this a reversal, a legitimate one or not? The Ichimoku hasn't made a final call yet, but it's giving more of a bias to the upside. Tenkin's still climbing gradually, so is the Kijun here. The Kumo is thinning out, but the price action is making penetrations onto the other side. Should the price action break and close on the other side and hold above it up till the 8th of December, once it gets past this little area here, this little region, the pair should probably work its way back up to 137-ish, close to just sub-138. It should start a reversal. However, it's not totally decided on that yet, and it has to do it in the near future. Why? Because this Kumo starts to really break down in structure. Remember, the Kumo is designed to be representative of support and resistance. Right now, it's pretty thick. So if it makes it on one side, the top side, then it has a fair amount of support under it. And if it makes it on the bottom side, it has a fair amount of resistance. But as it breaks down in structure here, it no longer offers any solid footing on either side of the market. So what does that tell you? That the pair probably will not make any gigantic trending moves. That it will probably kind of just bounce around and have a very kind of rangy, choppy, isolated structure. So what the Ichimoku ultimately is saying is, look, short-term bias is to the upside, but this pair better get its foot on the gas in the near future if it really wants to make some headway on the upside. Because if it doesn't, then the euro is going to have a hard time making huge gains to the upside or huge gains to the downside. It'll just be choppy. And not surprising that it's predicting that. You know, as we get further into the price section probably will get choppier because liquidity will start thinning out. Institutional funds are already starting to pull out. I've been starting to trade less and less. I know a lot of institutional traders that are trading less and less. 
bottom line is people are going to be trading a lot less as we go into the holidays deeper and deeper. And that's what the Kumo is saying. It's basically saying as time goes on, trading will become more complex and more choppy. And so now is the time for it to make a move. If it doesn't do it, then expect a complex, slight upward bias if the structure just holds where it is right now. But this offers us a play. Bottom line is it offers us a play. It offers us two plays. A, if we get a Kumo break and close on the other side, then once we clear this 34, 37 level, the pair should work its way up to 36 and 37, possibly 38. The alternate scenario is if this pair doesn't make any new highs and starts to sell off and can get below this Kumo right around here by the 9th, then it threatens to produce what is called a Tenkin Kijun cross. That's where the Tenkin crosses over the Kijun, either upward or downward. A downward cross would be a generic bearish signal. Upper cross would be a generic bullish signal. But more specifically, if it were to cross downward inside the Kumo, according to the Ichimoku cloud, that would be a medium strength crossover. It means it would be a solid crossover. And if that were to happen and price action were to breach to the below end of this Kumo, the chances of it returning back to the lows here become very probable. So you, for people who want to be bearish, look for that signal. For people who want to be bullish, look for the Kumo break signal. It's beautiful. It offers really both sides of the coin. It's very diplomatic. Um, it's kind of like the Canada of diplomacy. So that's what it's communicating about the euro US dollar. Sterling, it's also communicating a similar picture, but I want to just start with the daily and then work my way down again. So the sterling, it had had a slightly lesser penetration or break on the other side of the Kuma. It wasn't as dramatic. And it's also threatening to go deeper into the Kumo at the moment on the daily charts. And it's also threatening to clear the 20 MA at the same time. And so this to me represents a little more strength than the euro dollar does. On top of it, this Kumo is not super huge. And so it doesn't have to fight as much resistance at this moment. Now, from a four hour time frame, we're kind of also seeing that reflected as well. It was below the Kumo from the same time the euro was on the 9th of November. Actually, it didn't actually get below the Kumo until the 15th. So it took a little bit longer to get below the Kumo. That means it spent less time below the Kumo and it has now pierced it and is threatening to close on the other side of it. Contrast to the euro, which is still inside of it. So it suggests the strength is slightly more biased on the sterling side than on the euro side. That could create a play in a euro sterling short, but if you want to just trade an isolated sterling trade, well now we have both scenarios also as well. We have possible Kumo break on this side, but the advantage of this one here is it doesn't have this previous swing high here to deal with. Is there any fibs in the way? Let's take a quick look. Okay, we got this one here and this one here. So this actually might work out pretty good trade out for the longs. If this can close on the other side of the Kumo, it has a good chance of using this FIB as support and then making a move up to the other Fibonacci, which lines up with previous resistance. It's a good 70 pips inside this. Not a bad play. Decent intraday play. And so keep an eye on this one here. For shorts, if the pair can sell off, a couple hundred pips in by the 9th of December and create a downward tank and Kijun cross, then it increases the probabilities that this thing will retest the lows here at 155. So again, it offers scenarios on both sides of the market. This one is a little more biased to the upside than it is the downside. Tankin is stronger on this one. It's higher into the Kumo. Um, same with the Kijun. So it's got a little bit stronger structure in the short term for the bulls. So keep an eye on this one here. It could produce signals on either side of the market, really offering something for both bulls and bears. Okay. I want to spend just a brief moment talking about Aussie, dollar Swiss, 
and then we will uh, wrap it up for today. Now, Aussie Dollar had, until recently, not been inside the Kumo for quite some time, since July, five months. It then penetrated the Kumo. Penetrated the Kumo, which is the first time we've done that in five months, and it made a pretty good penetration, good 50% in. But then the pair has re-emerged outside of it, and it did so with vigor. Last three days of buying took out about eight days of mixed selling. So that now communicates to us that the pair was scooped up at cheaper prices. The institutional market was happy to buy air at cheaper prices. And that it could be starting another run for the previous high. It did something similar with the euro, where it made a penetration into the Kumo, and then it made another run. The re-trigger of the signal was started with the pair breaking back outside the Kumo, but then eventually it made another Tenkikijin cross to the upside. It was an upward cross inside the Kumo, which is a medium strength signal. It's threatening to do something similar with the Aussie dollar. If it were to do that, make an upward Tenkikijin cross, in the next few days, that would add to a further bullish momentum on this pair and likely produce a trade or move that would go back up to the highs around 101.49, just sub 102. So chances are it will make another run to these previous highs there. So watch for a tanking Cajun cross to the upside, because if it does that, that could produce a very powerful move and a good trade to get in. One thing we have to watch out gently for is a lot of technicians have been watching closely a potential head and shoulders pattern. Um, but it's beginning to look less and less like that. And if it can start to close above 99.30, 99.40, you know, break above parity again, then I think that pattern is negated. However, if it starts to sell off from here, then that pattern will still be active and in play. So keep an eye on this one here. There are definitely some opportunities on both sides of the market on this one here for Aussie dollar. Now on the four hour time frame, for those of you that had our newsletter, we had mentioned on Thursday, which Thursday was the second, we had mentioned on the second, this day right over here, right when price sanction is doing this, traders should watch out for a Kuma break to the upside because if it does, it could produce a pretty big move in Aussie dollar. And that's what happened. It produced a Kumo break and went from 97.75 up to 99.50, 175 pips. And it had actually climbed after the Kumo break for 12 straight hours. So if you were part of the newsletter where I sent out my Ichimoku trade alerts, you would have gotten into that or at least seen that and could have made some good money off that one there. The other one that we had talked about was Dollar Swiss, we had talked about, hey, hey, this thing has went a long time. If it does, it will probably present a pretty good short opportunity. And it broke the Kumo at 99.50 and went all the way down to sub 97.50. Keep an eye on that one there because Dollar Swiss, you know, have produced a great move and now is threatening some follow-up possible returns back to the 99.50 level. But now you can really see the power of the Kumo break especially when used correctly, can produce some very good moves, 150, 200 pip moves. And it doesn't take long to capture that 150, 200 pips. Okay. Gino says, when will trade levels and volumes restore to normal? January 15th in February? It's a great question. Um, I usually, usually volumes will start to pick up the second week in January. The first week, I think, starts on the third. Yeah. So trading will really start to return back to normal on the second or the third. Well, at least uh, they'll return. And then you got to understand, some people are still on holiday. Some people have that week off. There's some bank holidays and things like that. So trading will probably be light and thin during that week. Probably the week after, which would be around the 10th. You know, that's when you see trading volumes start to return back to some sort of normalcy. So that's my thoughts on that one. Um, they should be back to, you know, normal levels by February.
But, it, you know, it really depends. You know, we used to have a saying, the markets are cyclical from stocks to strawberries. And so, you know, like strawberries, they have seasons and things like that. You know, when the market has a new year, bottom line is the performance numbers for funds for that year, for that last year, they're done. They're over. It's a new season. It's, you know, people tend to forget what happened last year and they say, look, we're in a new cycle and we need to treat this as a new entity. So it provides a fresh perspective, fresh look, and that could create some good volatility right off the bat or it could create some low volatility. I've seen years where the market just didn't do anything until March and then the, the, the pairs are going on two, 3,000 pip runs. And then I've seen but they didn't do anything until March. And then I've seen years where the very beginning of the year, the second of the year, they just were busting out of the gate and they were flying and they were moving heavy. So it changes often. And so it, we have to really wait and see till early January, see how the market starts. And it could be a barn burner or it could be a snoozer. And so we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay, I have time for one chart. Uh, anybody can pick a pair in a time frame. You have to pick both for them to qualify. And then what I'll do is I'll do some live Ichimoku analysis on that. And then we'll uh, wrap it up for the day. DB was fast on the draw, 30 minutes sterling. She shoots from the hip. If we have enough time, we can look at uh, your Aussie one as well. Okay, 30 minutes, let me get some time here. Kiss a medium tanking Kijun cross. It had a brief Kumo break, but then that was a short lived one, and that restarted a new move, and it had a medium tanking Kijun cross right here right around mid and low 57s, and that thing has been above the Kijun and 20 MA since then. So that trend is still alive on the Sterling. If you're a, a very short-term day trader, I would still want to be short. You'd have to be careful at these levels right up here, which is kind of close to where we are. Um, but the bottom line is I'd still want to be long on this one here. You can watch for a reset of a tanking Kijun cross to the upside again, so it'd have to do a downward then upward again. Ideally, that cross would be above the signal, uh, above the Kumo. If it were to do that, then that would probably produce another intraday move. So keep an eye on that one there. Um, that's my thoughts on Sterling on 30 minutes. We do have enough time for Alex's Aussie dollar in the daily time frame. Kind of already done this, but we'll take a look at it again. Which is that keep an eye out for the possible head and shoulders. It's a weak structure now at this point. But keep an eye out for it. Could have some play. Um, if price closes above 99.30, 99.50, then I suspect that head and shoulders will no longer be valid or active and it won't be an issue. Um, also, if this thing produces another upward tank and Kijun cross in the next few days, that means it'll probably rechallenge these highs here and maybe go for a run past the highs at 101.57. So it could be it could be the sign of another run up in the Aussie US dollar. Keep an eye on that one there. That's my thoughts on that one there. All right, I have just enough time for KOs. Alex says, do I trade based on technicals? I trade only on technicals. Um, okay, now one say one. Ninety-eight point five percent of all my trades are based on technical models. One point five percent of my trading activity is based on fundamental models. Okay. Um, so KO wants to look at dollar CAD. KO, you got to tell me what time frame. What time would you like it on the dollar CAD? KO has no time frame. I can't analyze if you don't give me a time frame. Okay, why not? Fair enough. All right. Hmm. Choppy mess. Bear flag pattern, you gotta watch out for that. Kumo is a mess, basically saying, look, 
while it keeps doing this thing, there really is no support and resistance that is going to be huge. There's no support and resistance inside this entire thing. You know, it's going to be really only at the top of the bottom. So this thing's confirming this 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 kind of flag structure. It's basically saying, look, ideal would be if in the next two hours it can get above this flag structure, it can get below it. If it can't, the structure gets much more complicated and messy and not something that would be too great to trade. So um, it doesn't have a bias, the upside or downside. Um, but if it can break out of this flag structure in the Kumo, then it would have more of a bullish bias than it would have a bearish bias. It would be a short-term long opportunity in there. But other than that, it's not the greatest environment. Um, you know, and understandably so since we came to that, you know, those lows there. And it's basically just sitting at the lows, trying to, to hold up there. So not the favorite structure for Ichimoku. It's kind of a stand aside. Okay. Last question, then we're going to wrap it up. John G has a question. All right, Chris, does time spent attacking the Tenkin span, ten, the, the Senku span A, not Tenkun span, it's Senku span A, suggest anything to you such as the GU4 we're talking about? Usually, the more times it attacks it, the greater the chance that it's going to break it, but it also depends on how it attacks it. If it attacks it once, pulls back, has a good pullback and then attacks it again, then it's really going, it's really trying to break that level. If it fails after that second time, then the chances of it breaking it a third time decrease. Um, but, you know, in terms of time attacking it, I would look at it as more as the, I would look at it as both structure and time. How many times has it attacked it? How long has it been attacking it? And what was the structure of it? You know, it could be attacking it for 36 hours, but if it has a rounding type feature, that would not be too great. That would signal more of a reversal opportunity than when a breakout opportunity. So um, I would look at both structure and time. So hopefully answers your question. Okay, fantastic. I'm going to wrap it up. So uh, I want to thank you all very much for coming. Um, I think I only got one more week of teaching these classes and then I'm done for the holidays. Um, so hopefully I'll see you guys next week. If you have any questions, maybe this is new to you. Uh, if you have any questions about Ichimoku, check us out at secondskiesforks.com. We have tons of free videos and articles on there that you can read and enjoy. And if you have further questions about that or my courses, feel free to check us out at secondskies.com. I'd love to hear from you. Until then, I wish you all good luck trading. Best of luck, and I'll see you guys next week. Take care, everyone.